This program airs statewide on California Public Television and is a California's Gold Classic. Hi, I'm Huell Hauser, and right now we're all riding on the Blue Line, which is the new light rail system connecting downtown LA with downtown Long Beach, a distance of just about 22 miles. Now the Blue Line is fast and efficient and clean. In fact, there's not even any graffiti here. And even though it's just recently gone into full service, everybody around here knows about it. It's really kind of become a local landmark. And that's the theme of this particular program as we travel to three different places in our state and take a look at the things that each one of them is famous for. Now the three places and the three things they're famous for are all very different and interesting. And you're definitely invited to come along on this little adventure as we go up and down the state in search of California's gold. California, here I come. Right back where I started from Where bowers of flowers bloom in the sun Each morning at dawn and a little birdie sings and everything A sun-kissed miss said, don't be late And that is why I just can't wait So open up your golden gates, California, here I Now to get to our first location, we stay on the Blue Line until the 103rd Street stop. And after getting off, we walk a couple of blocks, turn a corner, and we're there. Now from a distance at first, you're not sure exactly what you're seeing. But the closer you get, you know it's something special. Welcome to the Watts Towers, located right in the middle of the community of Watts in Los Angeles. I'd heard about these towers for years. I'd even seen pictures of them. But pictures don't even begin to prepare you for what they're like up close. Built back in the 1920s, 30s, and 40s by an Italian immigrant construction worker named Simon Rodia, they're an unbelievable assemblage of giant towers made of steel and concrete. They're also walls covered with seashells and melted glass and brightly colored pieces of tile. For over 30 years, Simon Rodia lived here, held a full-time job as a tile setter, and spent almost every minute of his spare time creating this masterpiece. Then, one day in 1954, he gave his towers to a neighbor and simply walked away from it all and moved up to Northern California to live with his brother. A year after he left it, his house burned down, and the towers themselves began to fall into disrepair. In fact, by 1959, the Los Angeles Building and Safety Department wanted to have the whole thing declared unsafe and torn down. But thanks to a quickly formed committee of local citizens, the towers were saved and over the years have been preserved and restored. Today, they're administered by the Los Angeles Cultural Affairs Department, and in 1990, they received national landmark status. Now, during my visit, I quickly discovered that over the years, the Towers have cultivated a rather interesting group of fans. Actually, they're more than that. They're people who have spent years of their lives helping the Towers survive. People like Bud Goldstone, an aeronautical engineer who first got involved with the Towers back in 1959 when he volunteered to conduct the stress test, which ultimately proved the Towers were safe and didn't have to be torn down. He's been around ever since, and he loves the place. And, uh, and there aren't very many magic places, but the Watts Towers are really a magic place. And people who think they've seen them from a photograph really haven't. I mean, you really have to come out here and, and, uh, and visit the Watts Towers and poke around and look at all the wonderful decorations and the shapes and materials to, to really understand them, and they're just wonderful. And look at this. I, I mean, this makes no 
this compared to this? What what is this? That is a piece of stone. It, it looks like looks volcanic. volcanic. Yes, and uh, we've had rock hounds come out here, and they've looked at some of the panels, which are only rocks, and they've said, "How did he ever get all these rocks?" And of course, I couldn't answer the question either. <laughs> but uh, they ha he has rocks from all over the country, and they're placed in various places in the in the wall, like right here. Look at L this. Look at, there, there are about I think 18 different kinds of rocks. Someone told me in this particular panel, and almost none of them are indigenous to California. So he collected them and got them from somewhere. Now, see, I've been out here for. A all day walking up and down past this wall and until you pointed it out I hadn't really noticed this yeah. it's well, I don't think I noticed this one up here until you pointed it out either <laughs> so it can happen you know? Wow and then there's Marvin Rand who's been coming here regularly to take pictures since 1948 when he was a student at Art Center College of Design now as a photographer this must be a dream come true to come over here and be able to photograph oh, all yeah, of this. Oh yeah, it's a complete bonanza, you know. <laughs> <laughs> you got uh, any, uh, you look at any, any portion or, uh, of, of, the, uh, of the art and, and you, can, you have to be very selective because it's just, there is a glut of just things happening. Now, for a number of years now, the towers have been in the process of being completely restored. Lots of drilling and scrubbing going on to bring them back to their original splendor. Did he build it well when he built it? Oh, absolutely. It's phenomenally built, actually. What do you mean, phenomenally built? Well, considering that he, had, he didn't bolt them together, he didn't weld them together, they're simply tied together, and they stand. And usually reinforced concrete has a much thicker um, uh, shell of concrete around the steel um, and here he, he just dealt with it in the most unusual manner and it, and it holds up remarkably well. It works. Oh yeah, it works phenomenally well. In fact, what we try to do is we try to get close to the properties of the materials that he used for repairs because they're so good. It just works. Now there are a lot of interesting stories about the towers and the man who built them and some of the best are told by Billy Hale a well-known television and motion picture director who first met Simon Rodia in the early 1950s. You see, back then, Billy decided to do his USC film project on the towers. Well, over a period of months, he produced a remarkable film. In fact, what we're looking at is the only film ever made of Simon Rodia at work on his beloved towers. He was so... Agile. I don't know how old he was at that time. I'd say about maybe 70, 75, something like that. And he'd go scampering up. The, there wasn't an ounce of fat on this guy. You know, he was a sinewy little, intense little Italian guy. And uh, he would all of a sudden see something he wanted to do and just go scampering up the towers. He'd have a bucket on his arm and he'd have tile in there and bits of, bits of wire that he would use at the connections of the steel girders to, to tie them together. Then he would put concrete over that and then embed different bits of broken glass or whatever in the concrete while it was wet. That was his sort of basic way to work. This is one of the few places I actually staged a scene with Sam. I, I, I told you he, uh, you know, he just went about his business and kind of ignored me, but I did want a thing of him working. So uh, I said, Sam, okay, you wait around the corner and you come around and you do something. So he came around kind of brushing off these tiles and stuff. And then I wanted to get him out on the railroad tracks, you know, where he bent all these steel girders, where he had actually used the railroad track itself as a thing to bend the, the girder on and bring it in here. So, of course, uh, when I was out here, this was a house, and it's all burned down since then. But uh, this is pretty much where the fireplace was. It was very simple inside here. He had a he had a horn, one of those old wind-up phonographs with a big horn and a bunch of opera records. Then he had a picture of, right up here, he had a picture of Romeo and Juliet uh, from the silent days, John Barrymore and whoever his Juliet was. Wow. And then some early pictures of the towers that the LA Times would come out here about every 10 years and do a progress thing on the, t they kind of, were aware that the towers were going on and they would come down here and, and do something. Did he mind you coming in and photographing his house? 
he was a little embarrassed because it was, you know, it wasn't very, it wasn't, there wasn't much here. You, you know what I'm saying? The, uh, like he had a shelf here with about a hundred bars of palm olive soap. And I said, Sam, what's this all about? And it turned out that he had, some streetcar conductor had chewed him out for not having the correct chain. So every time he wanted to break a bill to come home on the streetcar, he would buy a bar of soap and they would break the bill down for him. He'd get on the streetcar and nobody would bother him. And he had these hundreds of bars of soap. <laughs> <laughs> so there were all kinds of rumors about this place. I mean, here you had this man behind this wall building things and and the neighbors, I went around and talked to some of the neighbors just to say, what, you know, what do you think and all that. They thought he had a wife buried inside here. What? They thought his, this was the tomb of Sam's wife. This, I mean, this is one of, the, one of the many crazy rumors about this place. They thought these were secret radio towers that were used in World War II by the Japanese. They thought that Tokyo Rose was born here. If you remember Tokyo Rose. <laughs> really? That's right. Well, what was this thing? This was just purely and simply a ship. This was Marco Polo's ship. I don't know that Marco oh, Polo ever went by ship, but this is the Marco Polo ship. Wow. Sam was a big fan of the explorers, the people who set out, and, you know, Columbus, Marco Polo, people like that. This whole place is really in the shape of a ship. Uh huh. This is the, this is the prow of the ship here, and these are the masts. And, and all that. I mean, if you see this from above or from a distance, it really is a ship. So this is the Marco Polo ship. That's right. Without his wife being buried. We don't know. <laughs> <laughs> we don't know. <laughs> One of the important elements at Watts Towers these days is found right next door in the Watts Towers Art Center. Founded back in 1961, it serves not only as a true community center, but also as a focus point for the arts. For example, just about every day, the center is filled with visiting school children from all over Southern California. Children who have come to see the world famous towers and then get a little hands-on experience at creating their own art. I want you to take your circles and squares and all the geometric shapes that you see and you take your glue and I want you to place them on your paper in a beautiful pattern, just like the walls of the Watts Towers, okay? I think Mr. Rodia, or Sam as he's known in the neighborhood, would be delighted to see these children coming, using the available materials, putting them together in wonderful, crazy patterns. He would be happy that he inspired children from all over to create um, art objects. Just like he did. Just like he did. Do you think he would see this as a logical extension of his work, having this art center here? I think he would, and I think he does. <laughs> I, I really feel that that spirit is very much on site today. The whole notion of Simon Rodia saying very clearly that the human p potential can fly anywhere. They are spectacular these towers of steel and glass and concrete. Towers built over a 30-year period by a little guy with a big dream, a vision that's now been recognized as a national landmark. But what's really neat are not just the actual towers themselves, but the fact that they continue to inspire future generations. So you see, even though he walked away from his towers in the early 50s, never to see them again, Simon Rodia's dream is still very much alive, right in the middle of Watts. Wonderful. Now there's nothing quite as exciting as driving into San Francisco on the Bay Bridge on a beautiful sunny day. San Francisco, the city by the bay, famous for its cable cars, its ball teams, its romance. But we're here in search of something else the city is famous for. Something that's closer to your stomach than to your heart. Anything goes? Well, things were hopping down at the bakery at Fisherman's Wharf when we arrived. But I understand it's always busy here. Because you see, this is one of the places tourists and locals alike come to get their precious sourdough bread. 
Now, it's well documented that gold miners in these parts would bake up a batch of sourdough any time they could, their gold-panning tins doubling as bread pans. And then in 1849, Isidore Bodine opened up the first sourdough French bakery in the city, offering fresh sourdough bread to hungry San Franciscans. San Franciscans who quickly made this particular kind of bread part of life in their city. Over the years, many other brands of sourdough came along, but the demand just kept on growing. More and more people eating more and more sourdough bread. Today it's reached the point that sourdough bread is part of the San Francisco mystique. It's everywhere. And San Franciscans now eat three times more sourdough bread than the national average. We're talking millions of loaves every week. What is this love affair with sourdough all about? Well, to find out, I did some hands-on research, including several days with the people at San Francisco French Bread Company, which owns several of the most famous brands in the city, Toscana, Parisian, Colombo, and Bodine. Now, I started off my adventure in the back of Bodine's Fisherman's Wharf Bakery, where they have a small area set aside to actually bake bread. It was there I got my introduction to sourdough from two of the owners. Sourdough bread, generically, is a worldwide phenomena. It takes many different shapes and forms, and you find it virtually in every corner of the earth. It's um, every place civilized man has been, they found some way to, to make bread, and some of those forms have been sour-based. What's unique about our product is that it is what we think of as a confluence of cultures. It's a culinary landmark. Isidore Boudin um, was a French baker. He knew how to make French bread. He came to California and didn't have all the baking ingredients and fineries that he used in France, but what he did find was something unique to California at the time, which was this particular crock of sourdough, this particular sourdough. And he took that as his leavening agent and formed it in the shape of a traditional French loaf of bread. That's what's unique. This is truly an indigenous San Francisco product. Now, if I wanted to do a, a 60 Minutes type expose on how you make San Francisco sourdough bread, would you tell me? Uh, not everything. Not everything. <laughs> <laughs> No, I think not. We, we learned well from our father. Well, this was going to be more complicated than I'd planned. And to find out the real secret behind San Francisco sourdough bread, we next went over to the Bodine 10th Avenue Bakery in search of Sharon and Lou's dad, Steve Girardo, who owned Bodine for over 40 years and is now their master bread baker emeritus. He's there every morning in the bakery supervising things. Not only that, He's there at 4.30 a.m. every morning supervising things. It's still dark outside, but we were there, bleary-eyed and anxious to get the inside scoop. Mm -hmm. What is in here? Hey, there's the mother, the mother dough. The mother dough. The one that starts, if you want to call it a starter, but that's the mother. Now, is that part of the secret of the success of your bread? Yes. Oh. Uh-huh. Now, it just looks like a piece of dough. A piece of dough. That's it. But it's got, but it's still got, this is still dough from 1849. A piece of it, you know what I mean? So tomorrow, if we looked at this, it would be all the way up? Oh, tomorrow, that, oh, before that. But uh, tomorrow it's already made. They use it uh, to make some bread. I see. Okay, it's kind of confusing to somebody who does it. <laughs> That's, what I say. That's why I say, I can show you how to do it today. I'll pull in and you says, let's go over again. Let's go over again. Yeah, it's not as easy as it. <laughs> no, everybody, every trade has got its trick. And ours is very little, but it's got it too. Yeah, I'm beginning to, that's what I'm beginning to find out. <laughs> Well, you can see Steve wasn't about to give away any trade secrets, but it does appear that this 150-year-old starter, or mother dough as they call it, is a big part of the success of the sourdough bread. And sure enough, I found out there's been extensive research done 
that proves this particular mother dough that makes San Francisco sourdough bread so tasty thrives only in San Francisco. Take it somewhere else and try to make bread with it, and it just doesn't work. Maybe it's the air, or the water, or even the fog. But no doubt about it, this dough thrives only in San Francisco. Now Steve gave me the full $5 tour of the bakery, and as you can see, the place was full of atmosphere. A lot of old timey looking equipment and everything kind of hands on. No computers here. Another thing I noticed was that the place had a nice feel to it, warm and personal. Everybody working together, just like a big family, literally. You've got a lot of family members here, don't you? Yes, I do. Uh, Why don't you fact, introduce everybody? Because sure. you've got the whole family here. <laughs> sure, that's my old man right here, the main guy. This so, is your uncle. This is your Alfonso. uncle. Alfonso. And this is. This is Ernesto, my cousin. Your cousin. Yes. Yeah. And this is Alfonso Jr., my cousin. He's your his other son. cousin. Yes. His son. Yes. And, and this Francisco, my cousin too. So. And, uh, we got the whole family here. Yeah, I got my father too, but he's off today. And two other brothers, they're, they're off today too. Your father, two brothers, your uncle, and cousin. three cousins? Yes, and then another cousin, but he's not here too. What? But how long does this go on? Well, as long as they let us. <laughs> Did you know that he's got his whole family here? I better know. <laughs> <laughs> well, after meeting Fernando's family, it was time to leave the 10th Avenue Bakery and head back down to the Fisherman's Wharf Bakery, which was swarming with sourdough bread fanatics. Now you've got, you're loaded down with sourdough we bread just, here. We just finished this kind. Oh, you've already had some. We just killed it in the last five minutes. So and what have you got here? Another loaf. Now where are you gonna take this? Where are you from? Back to New Hampshire. Really? Yeah. Now why are you taking it all the way back to New Hampshire? No, we probably won't. We'll probably eat it in the car in the next five minutes. <laughs> We're from Kissimmee, Florida. Now. Do you have sourdough bread like this in Florida? No, we surely don't. Wonder why. I don't know. We have cornbread. <laughs> cornbread. <laughs> now here's a man over here chowing down on some sourdough bread. Have you ever had any of this before? Uh, I never eat this type of bread. Uh huh. I'm Italian. The first time uh, I've been in San Francisco. So this is yeah. your first taste of San Francisco sourdough bread. It's very good. Very uh -huh. good. Uh, it looks like uh, Italian bread. Oh, really? Very, or French bread. It's very good. Each day I eat at least one loaf for myself what? before I go home. And then I'm the other one in a bus because my husband did get upset that I eat too much bread. So you eat one here yes. and one on the bus going home? Each single day on my working day. And this is fat. <laughs> Now the last stop on our sourdough bread tour is Tadish Grill, downtown on California Street. This place has been around as long as the bread has, since 1849. And in here, sourdough is king. I love the taste, I love the texture of the bread, and the crust is crunchy. The crust is crunchy. Right. So you like the crust the better crust than the inside. And the inside. <laughs> So I eat the whole piece instead. <laughs> the crust is crispier and the inside is softer. Mm -hmm. And when you put butter on it, it's better than any place in the world. Really? London, Lisbon, name it. It is, really. Turlock. Turlock. Modesto. He's yeah. from Turlock. That's right. <laughs> I'm a dunker, so <laughs> you, you can rip it apart and dunk it in things, and it's <laughs> it's great with everything. It's good with pasta, it's good with soup, it's good with beans, it's good with fish, it's good with everything. I just eat the top of the bread. I like the top best. It's all good, but I like the top better than the rest. This isn't even something people have to order. It's there. Oh, it's, it's put on the table before they sit down. We, and we do th about 250 loaves a day. You're oh, yes, and uh, it's very popular. Perhaps it's just the fact that this city has, the, the ambiance in this city is a little different than any other city. It's foggy, you know, you're thinking of, when you think of San Francisco, you think of fog, you think of sourdough French bread, you think of cable cars. There's just a nice match. It all works. It's comfortable. I wonder if Isidore Bodin had any idea back in 1849 just what he was starting. Now I'm sure he was proud of his bread, but I think even he would be surprised at how far it's come. 
And even though no one, even the experts, really know for sure exactly why it's so tasty, everybody agrees that San Franciscans have a love affair with their sourdough bread that just keeps on growing. As we end the program, it's one of those beautiful days here in San Francisco. One of those picture-perfect, crystal-clear days where you can look out and see forever. And we really hate to leave. But to be completely honest with you, after doing all of this personal research on the sourdough bread story, I've gained at least two pounds, and I think it's time to go. As we go, as always, I'd like to thank everyone for their hospitality, and especially thank you for watching and invite you to tune in again next time as we continue our search for California's gold. California, here I come, right back where I started from, where bowers of flowers bloom in the sun. Each morning at dawn, and a little birdie sings in everything. A sun-kissed miss said, don't be late. And that is why I just can't wait. So open up your golden gates. California, here I Well, hello everybody, I'm Huell Hauser, and I sure hope you enjoyed this adventure. If you'd like to see it again or share it with your family or friends, or perhaps donate a copy to your local school or library, it's available on video cassette and on DVD. All you have to do is call 1-800-266-5727, and we'll be glad to send it to you right away. Mm -hmm.